Welcome to Moms Writers Club. Uh, this is where we talk all about being a mom and a writer. I'm Jessica. And I'm Sarah. And we are happy to have you here today. We are going to talk about alpha readers, beta readers, critique partners, what the differences are, and then some of the details pertaining to them. Sarah, would you like to tell everyone what an alpha reader is? Well, so Jessica introduced me to the concept of an alpha reader, actually. Um, this is somebody who, and sort of correct me if I'm wrong, this is someone who you give pretty raw work to. It's like pretty fresh stuff. So um, the way Jessica was an alpha reader for me on um, my last novel, and I would send her like a chapter or two at a time, like as I wrote them. And I wasn't asking for line editing. It wasn't at that point yet. Things were still pretty rough. It was more kind of like, is this thing hanging together? Um, is this going off in some crazy way that doesn't make sense? Um, are you still with me, basically? Yeah. Um, and, and it was really useful because it, it kind of... Um, I sort of imagine the story as like this big junky jalopy, like on this dirt road, like it's bouncing all over the place, <laughs> falling off the back, you know, but like having the alpha reader just kind of keeps it on the road, right? It's not going to go veering off into the woods. Um, I like how you describe that. <laughs> it's so true. And, um, you know, so that was really useful. It was kind of, and there were, there were points where she would ask questions like, um, or she would say things like, well, this doesn't, um, I just don't, I don't see this character doing this. Like, is there something you know about this character that I don't know yet that would, you know, make this make sense? Or, and then that sort of pointed me out to like where I needed to do some character development to kind of justify what was happening to kind of earn it. Um, so we went kind of chapter by chapter through the whole book to the end. Yeah. That sounds basically how I would have said it. It's just someone who's reading level stuff, not, yeah. like, not editing, not moving commas around. Like that's way, way later than the alpha. Like reading. the big stuff, like, um, almost like a developmental edit as you go in as some ways, go. making and sure think, to go I ahead. Think an alpha reader really, I think if, if you are going to even try this with somebody, I really think you need that person to be able to turn off their internal um, line editor, you know, yeah. like they kind of need to understand what level the story's at and not get in, not get bogged down in the details. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have two alpha readers and, and Sarah's one of them. Um, and I think it's been wonderful. It's something I didn't do for my first several books. And I started it with, I think with make me disappear actually, because that's, about the time I met um, Jamie and I was super nervous. So I understand that it's scary to send out really raw work. So for me, it was nice to be doing this with people I really trusted. And, but it's also really fun because every day we send each other a chapter or two and you kind of get to know that person a little more deeply as a writer and provide consistent feedback. And it kept me from going to weird places with my book on multiple occasions. Uh, just hearing, you know, this, like, like you said, this character would never do that, or this is maybe outside your genre a little bit, that sort of thing. And I have found it to be fantastic, mm -hmm. but I, I would not do this with your first book though. Get that first book written. Yeah. Like if you're working on your first book, get to the end first. Yes. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, but um, I mean, this is from this is from a person who like on my first couple books, I would go down like 30,000 word dead end roads, you know, and yeah. I don't regret them. I kept them and I actually have like have like taken back like 10,000 word chunks of them and wound up using them. I don't regret it, but it's a it's a it's a labor and time intensive way to write a book to keep Definitely. exploring all those roads until you figure out which is the right one it's know? like you write 150k to get your 80k novel oh easily <laughs> I, I did that with my first book 300k <laughs> to get my 80k novel that's you a know, lot which is when you're learning how to write I think it's kind of what it's kind of maybe something you got to do like well and even now words taught me to write but yeah and even now sometimes I know a scene is not working and I will write it wrong 
kind of to prove it to myself or to see what didn't work so I figure out where to go. Anyway, um, the, the next thing is beta readers. Okay, so a beta reader is someone who reads your book usually after you've done a round or two of revisions. So they are one of your early readers. Um, everybody does things a little bit differently. I usually will have someone alpha read as I'm writing, one or two people. And then I will actually run my, my book through Critique Partners first because they do more, we'll get into this, but they do more like developmental stuff for me. And then beta readers are like my test audience is how oh, I think. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're people who I imagine would pick up my book at a, a bookstore, which is a lovely thought, and, you know, be reading it from front to back and giving me their broad impressions. I don't expect in-depth feedback from them so far as like right. chapter like level. is a reader. Yeah. They're reading your book. They are not someone who's going you know, oh, this character arc didn't complete. And they might do that. You know, some people look at a book and think things like that without being a writer. That would, I guess, be the other thing I would say is I have beta readers who are not writers. Um, And I have some who are, but they are just uh, that initial read of your book. It's like when a video game releases a beta version. It is, you know, their test audience. Do you have anything to add to that? I think it's... It's tricky to find a really um, good beta reader because you, I mean, writers do make good beta readers, especially I've had a couple of um, beta readers um, that I met on Twitter who are writers, but are not people that I know well um, or personally um, and are not people who I have a regular like critique partner relationship with. And they made really good beta readers because they just read the book, but they're, they're writers. So they sort of had enough, um, they had enough of the language to be able to communicate to me, you know, thoughts and, um, their impressions and, and maybe like ideas about solutions here and there, but, but they were really just reading the book as a reader. Yeah. Sometimes it's tricky with people who are not writers, um, who read the book and they're kind of like, Oh yeah, it was good. Yeah. I liked it. You know? And then you're like, well, what about that part where, Oh yeah, I like that part. Yeah, that's true too. And you, you will find, we'll talk about where to find these people at the end, but you'll find people over time. Like, I don't think I use any of the beta readers I used on my first couple of books. And I think it's also useful, um, to do a couple things with beta readers. So this is, I think is like you were saying with your first book, um, it's good to just write the thing and get it done and then let some people read it. And then those are your beta readers. Um, It is useful with those people though, to set up um, kind of some expectations that- Definitely. To get an idea from them, how long they think it might take them to read it. Um, if or you can give them a deadline too. And if they can't yeah. meet that deadline, then they just don't beta read for you this time. No hard feelings. Yeah. Or you can say, oh, you can read the book, but I really need the feedback by X. Um, but that's useful because because people get busy and then like, then they feel guilty because they didn't finish your book. And then, you know. And they stop talking to you. I know. Then they ghost you and it's <laughs> not. Yeah. <laughs> It's really bad. Um, so it's good to set up some time expectations. And it's helpful, I think, for like for beta readers to have a list of questions like, you know, like your book club questions at the end of a novel, you know, yeah. um, what did you think about the relationship between this character and that character? Or, you know, what did you think about what Mr. So-and-so, you know, did at the end when he yeah. found the dog? Um, you can find lists of these questions online, by the way. Yeah. Or you can, you know, you can just take questions that things that you want to know about your own book, you know, or things that you're not sure of with your story. Yes. Give your, give your beta reader a little list of five questions and, and then like buy them a nice bottle of wine. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely be gracious with these people and thank them. And please do not argue with them. They're telling you what they oh, think. That's so true. It is not your job to like try to convince them. Otherwise they're giving you feedback off of how they read it and yeah. not you know, not how you meant it, but how they read it. 
Yeah, because um, eventually the dream is that your book is going to wind up in the hands of somebody who has never and will never meet you or talk to you. And they will just read your book and you won't be there to like explain why yeah. X, Y, and Z happened. So your beta readers are, are giving you a gift by, um, by pointing stuff out. Yeah. Um, so part of this topic we, we'd already planned on doing, but then Kelly on Twitter asked some questions and she, we kind of haven't been talking about this, asked about like chapter versus sending them the whole manuscript. And I think it's really up to you. I used to do chapter by chapter for my beta readers because I felt like sending someone 10 pages was a lot easier for them to like quickly get back to me instead of sending them a whole manuscript. I think those people probably responded at, like at a higher percentage instead of ghosting. But I also think that like they lost continuity mm -hmm. with that. It also took a lot longer over time. Like as you find people that you know will actually do it. I now prefer to send a whole book. I think the first book I sent you, I sent in thirds, mm -hmm. which is another way to do it. And oh, at the like end that. of each third, I had questions. And you had the next third ready for me. Yeah. I didn't have to wait around. Yeah. 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 Anything yeah. else on beta readers? I was think there was something I was thinking of just now. Oh, that the 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 beta reading the, um, the period of time in which you send a book to a beta reader is uh, can coincide with the period of time that you don't look at the book, right? Yeah, that, that's a great idea. That incredibly important rest period when you've finished a work and you need to just let it sit and you need to get some distance from it. That's the time when it's off with your beta readers, you know, and you can be like, hey, if you could get back to me in a month with your comments, then that would be great. And then don't don't change it because they're reading your finished copy of it right now. Exactly. Don't tinker, don't touch it. And then when they come back with comments and then you're coming back with fresh eyes, it's really can be, um, you know, you can really be very productive with that with that break. Yeah, I agree. Um, there were two other things I wanted to mention about this, and I'm trying to remember what they both were. I know there is such a thing as a paid beta reader, and I would approach this with caution, but I have used a paid beta reader, reader before when I needed a really quick read, and I didn't want to like beg people to do it. And I also, oh, this ties into the other thing. Family members may or may not make good beta readers. I don't typically recommend them. I do have one aunt who is very well read and has a degree in like English and something else and she will give me like pretty good feedback but in general your parents are probably going to tell you they love your book yeah. so sometimes it's good to have it be a stranger yeah which I know can be a little bit scary because it's someone you don't know I use the website fiverr f-i-v-e-r-r dot -R com and I found someone that had a lot of reviews. So like I knew that they were a legit business, but I needed like seven day turnaround and she actually provided incredible feedback. I think it cost $50 and she read my whole book, which was around 85 K. Wow. So and I wouldn't so say that that's like the best way to go. I would recommend finding and making relationships with good beta readers, but it is an option if you are in a situation where, you know, you need a quick read or you just can't find one more person and you need one more person or you need someone new who's objective. She's read a couple of my books and I've been very help, very happy with her feedback. That's cool. Yeah. So then our next topic was just critique partners, which are a little different. What do you think about that? So I think of critique partners as um, people who will do any of the above with your work and that you have more of a um, ongoing relationship with and and who you swap with. Yeah, um, swapping is the big part of it too. Yeah, yeah, you know, like I've read Jessica's work, Jessica has read my work. Um, we've read, she's read very drafty portions of my work. She's read more polished portions of my work. She's read like a big chunk at once. She's read it in small bits, you know, so we've developed a, you know, a partner relationship with yeah. around our work and around <clears throat> critiquing each other's work. I would say it's not necessary to be like friends with your critique partners, but that has happened with all three of my critique partners. 
we've become pretty good friends, which I really like. I feel like it, I don't, I don't know. I feel like I can be more open with them, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we started as critique partners, which means that first and foremost, we're going to be honest with each other about our books. And, you know, I'm going to be nice, but I'm going to tell you what I really think, which yeah. I think is also important. Yeah. Um, and it's a very personal thing that we're doing, you know, um, I think one of the really special things about having a critique partner over a little bit of a longer period of time who's maybe read more than one of your stories is that that person kind of gets to know your voice and gets to know like the themes that are important to you and um and can sort of refer back to previous work like remember in your last book when you did this um yeah you know that I mean, it, this made me think of that or 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 can like reflect your progress you know like oh the you know the dialogue in this book is really great like that's that's really like you've hit another level since your last work so that's kind of fun too i would agree and i would also say for that reason you should um like when i am considering working with a critique partner we usually exchange just a couple of chapters and there have been times where I've said, you know, no thank you to people because I just don't like their writing or, you know, one person covered a topic that I was really uncomfortable reading. Mm. I love Sarah's writing. So we make great critique partners that, you know, that doesn't mean I don't point out things that are wrong, but just making and the point that. And, and like, I think as readers, like you're more of a broad reader. Than yeah. I, but I write like, thriller, but I read everything. I was not really a thriller reader. Like, yeah. I mean, but you're so good about like the personal relationships and like the um like story arc and character like you are such a good reader and writer in general though that you pick up on things differently than like my thriller critique yeah partner. yeah so it's good to have um like critique partners in your genre and outside of your genre you know yeah. but definitely have at least one or two in your genre a, a variety of voices is is always good but you Sarah. cannot be trying to please all of them or you will make yeah. it crazy. At some point, you just got to like, you got to be like, I'm the boss of this story, you know? So where do you find these, um, these creatures? Well, that's a fun question. I, it was, it was hard to find them. It took me a couple, years, well, a year probably to really find good critique partners who I now hope to like go my career with. Mm -hmm. I would say... Twitter has been a big place for me, which I wouldn't have guessed I would ever say that because when I first got on Twitter, I had like zero followers and no one interacted with me. And it just, people say it takes time, you know, get involved, get to know people. And it's very true. Mm -hmm. Find a club, whether it's mom's writers club or 5am writers club or whoever, whatever, and talk to people and comment on their stuff and kind of get to know them. And, and not only will you make friends that way, but when it gets to the point where you're sharing your work with someone, you'll feel better about it because it is a little scary to send your work out to someone you don't know. And for that reason, I would also suggest sending just a chapter or two to start with and uh, see if you like the feedback they give you, if you yeah. find it helpful. Yeah. What about you? So Twitter, where else? Um... Well, when we're back to doing things actually in person, um, there's a, I took several in-person workshops, writing workshops at a, at a little nonprofit organization here. And, and I just met people in class. Yeah. That's a great place. Um, actual human beings face to face. Um, Imagine that. <laughs> you know, I actually had a really awesome uh, critique group for um, like three years um, we would meet every, we'd meet maybe once a month or so. And this was when I was writing a lot of short stories. One of us was writing a novella. One of us would submit, sometimes we'd submit chapters of novels, but, um, but it was really fun that we'd get together with four of us. It's so fun. And all four of us would read, you know, two people's writing and we would talk about it. It was like a little yeah. mini workshop. It was totally great. And then, and then one guy got a, got a postdoc fellowship at, at Oxford and wow. molecular biology. And so he left us and then it kind of fell apart. But I would definitely look into local writing groups. I was a member of the 
I'm going to say the letters in the wrong order, SCWBI, which is like children's, mm. um, but they were so nice. They accepted me. I only write adult, but they accepted me. And um, so Annie and I already knew each other, but that's kind of where we met again. And she's one of my critique partners. So most genres do have, whether you write romance or thrillers or whatever, there are a lot of- Romance Writers of America, yeah. there's the Women's Fiction Writers Association. There are like crime sisters, I think. Mm -hmm. um, if you just do a Google search, you will find them. And a lot of them have local chapters, whether they have Facebook groups or actual meetings locally. So that's a great place to find them. There are a bunch of Facebook writing groups. I know people find critique partners through there as well. I'm trying to think if there's anywhere else. Uh, the big thing to me is just ask. Like, yeah. you're not gonna, you're not gonna find anybody if you don't ask. And you can just put it out yeah. there and and field whatever responses you get. You know. Yeah, put it on Twitter. And then um, we mentioned this in another episode, but on Moms Writers Club, we do critique partner matches. We've done two. I'm sure we'll do another one soon. And we just do them as part of our Wednesday night chats. And I know people have found people to work with through there and made friendships through there as well. I just want to see if Kelly had any other questions in there. Okay. She also asked about editors. I have mixed opinions. I don't think you need to hire an editor and I definitely wouldn't do it right off the bat. If you want to and you have the money to, a good one will be a good amount of money. And if they're not a good amount of money, I would be a bit cautious um, because anybody can call themselves an editor just like anyone can call themselves an agent. Yeah. But I mean, you certainly can use an editor, but make sure you've done a few rounds of revisions yourself so that you're getting the most out of it. And I guess kind of know what you're looking for going into it. I did have an editor look at my second book primarily because I felt like I was doing something wrong and I couldn't figure out what it was. And my beta readers weren't really helping me. They were trying to, they were great, but I wasn't. And how did it work with the editor? Did, did it, did it get, did you get what you were looking for? I think so. So I actually asked an author I knew who was published if she would recommend someone and she had a couple of recommendations and I went on their websites and looked around to see who they had worked with and they were legit editors. It was pretty expensive, I think for 50 pages. I mean, by expensive, I mean, they work hard and they, they deserve to make this money, yeah. but it's still a good amount of money because they're working hard on your book. I found it helpful because I was still a very new writer and I was struggling to set up my character and my plot in a way that kind of fits into the mold that at least we as Americans follow. And she gave me some tips for that. And once she pointed out what I was doing wrong, it's carried forward into my other books, but I don't know, proceed with caution. I think they can be really wonderful. But yeah, they are I worked with an editor, um, and I, I went through this um, this service called New York Book Editors. I'll put the link below. Um, and they are a service that connects actual industry professional editors who do freelance work with people That's who good. are looking for freelance editors. So it's kind of a, like a vetting service. Um, and they, they were awesome so they take they took a sample of my writing and i sort of told them what i was looking for and they put it out to some of you know some of their stable of editors and they connected me with this woman named laura chasen who does um freelance editing work she worked for um a number of years at saint martin's press um I think she might be doing freelance work for the Amazon imprint now. Anyway, mm -hmm. so they connected me with her. And yeah, it was expensive. Um, and I deliberately went into it. Um, and, I, and I talked to her up front before she read the book. I talked with her on a, on a Zoom call for like, you know, 45 minutes about where I'm at in my career, what I'm looking for. And I very specifically was like, you know, yes, I'd love to get this book published. Yes, I do want to polish it up and make it awesome, but really I want to learn how to write. And I'm not going to get an MFA. And my and the local writers workshops are short story oriented. Um, and it felt to me like, you know, at the time I was looking at, like, could I take a college class? I mean, what else can I do? to learn how to write. 
I think um, that's a great way to approach it, that you wanted to learn to write better. Because I would say that's what I got out of it too. Yeah. And that is exactly what I went into it um, wanting. I was like, I can spend a certain amount of money like on a class or a workshop or whatever, or on this, you know? And, um, and I told her that. And um, I base I was so, so happy with that experience. I mean, I basically got like a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> class on my novel. That's fantastic. And she was absolutely lovely and generous with her time and her expertise. She'd sent me like a seven or eight page edit letter. Um, she did not line edit it because I didn't ask, I didn't want her to do that. It was a developmental edit. But she did make all these like in text references in her letter to, you know, page X or page Y or whatever. She was very, very detailed. And I just feel like, God, I got this like amazing professional tutorial on my book. Um, well, it sounds like you had a really good experience. I so much. But I really, you know, I did look into some other, you know, I did sort of look at some other editors' websites and stuff. And um, I do think it's a really broad range. And so I appreciated having this sort of vetting service um, yeah. find me somebody really really professional. I hired another editor because she was running a special that was very affordable. And that experience was not good. And that's why I say to be cautious and know what you're getting and know where they've worked and what they've done. This editor promised me a full developmental edit of, I yeah, I think the full manuscript. And she gave me less than the $50 beta reader. Hmm. Like if I had spent what she normally charges I would have been very, very upset. So just know what you're getting into, get yeah. references. I and, like the vetting service. And do a sample edit. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. Most editors do that. Yeah, they really should offer you a sample edit. And that was part of the process that, that I went through. You know, she edited like the first five pages and gave me some feedback, you know, which probably didn't take her very long. And and I think I, I think I paid for it. I think I paid like, $35. Okay. Like I've seen that. a lot of them offer it for free for that piece. Some people will offer it for free. Um, but, and then I got a sense and, and I'd had actually another editor look at this same piece of work and I had done the same thing to get a sample edit back. And it was amazing how different they were. Yeah. Um, like completely different. The things that, you know, one editor loved the other editor was like, Hmm, I don't know about this. And I, you know, wound up going with the one who I felt like got my voice and, yeah. you know, sort of got where I was coming from. And it wasn't, was, uh, I was like, with the one I was thinking, you know, God, if I take all that stuff out, I don't sound like myself. Yeah. You know? And interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you had a good experience like that. That sounds really lovely. Yeah. It was awesome. I mean, like I still, I, you know, when I got, when I got, um, when I signed with Laura Bradford, I sent Laura Chasen an email. I was Aww. like, oh my God, I'm just That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's she was cool. very excited and she emailed me back. And, yeah. <laughs> so you can make connections that way. And, you know, with, with in, in all of these yeah. relationships, these are connections that you make to other writers and to other industry people. And, you know, just remember that, that, these are people who might be with you for your whole career and your whole creative life. And you never know where these relationships will lead you. Sarah and I will be running a half marathon. We would have never guessed that. <laughs> Maybe a full marathon, October. I am not going to do a full You're because I don't have anyone to, I'm, I'm not running long runs with my daughter in a stroller. No, <laughs> we have a few questions. Susan asked, She'd like to know if a contemporary story that is not literary and upmarket fiction being set in Canada affects its marketability. I, that was I an interesting question. What's that? I thought that was such an interesting oh, yeah. question. What do you so I honestly have no idea because I don't live in Canada, but Bianca uh, Murray, she specifically addressed this question in her podcast a couple episodes back. Her podcast is called The Shit No One Tells You About Writing. And Carly Waters and Cecilia Lira are two agents that talk on it. 
And I'm so sorry, I don't remember which episode it is. It's sometime in the second season. Yeah. But they talk specifically about this question and they answer it very thoroughly. And I don't remember what the answer is. I think it was, it depends. Um, so I would recommend you look that up, but I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm not in Canada yeah. or anywhere near there. I don't know either. Um, I think there are probably, this is just me just thinking out loud, that there are probably other factors that are more important. Uh, if you write a really great book that people are gonna read it. Yeah, um, I would agree. Not, not, I mean, I don't know, but I agree. Like, oh, I'm not gonna read that because it's set in Toronto and not New York, you know? What I would say is if I pick up a book that's set in Kansas City where I was born, I will give that book like a little more time because I think it's cool to read about like a place that I used to live, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I would say that I'm frankly completely sick of reading about New York City. Like me too, because like half the books written. I'm like, yeah. Okay. You're like, God. And Maybe I'm, I'd feel differently if I'd spent time there, but I'm oh, tired. I'm, of sure. I'm sure, but I'm like over it. Like I'd love to read a book that's set in Montreal. You know. Yeah. Me too. So I don't know. I think if it's a good book, I would read your book. Sajna. Uh, she had a question as a pantser, what are the things I need to be aware of during the rewriting process? I would love to hear more about the editing process. I am a pantser. I would say that, I mean, writing is rewriting. Know that you may have to completely rewrite scenes. Just know that you're gonna be doing more revising and that's okay. And as you write more books, you will probably do less revising. Um, I have a friend who is, uh, she writes YA and she just sold her first two books for a very nice sum of money. Um, and she talks, she's a total pantser and she talks about having like kind of tent poles in place. Like she kind of knows, um, cause I think the, and, and this is coming from me being sort of starting out totally as a pantser, like from word one, like just start and go and hope for the best. Um, and then I just had this really, I had to really learn structure. I wound up writing a couple of very long meandering um, stories that did not hang together structurally, even though they were full of lovely scenes and sentences and lots of voice. Um, so, what she refers to is like kind of knowing what her structural tent poles are. Like I kind of know there's this one and and I know there's this midpoint and then I know there's this, you know, this one that, that this is the climax. And I think even if you're a total pantser, it's not a bad idea to kind of think about what the sort of maybe four big structural points of your story are. Even if you don't necessarily know what they are from the beginning, just kind of knowing that you're going to need some structure in there can be helpful. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I was trying to think of how I felt about it. Um, I am a total pantser who has, who I, I usually have like a vague idea of some of those. I do, what I do is I actually get out that book, Save the Cat, and I like, I fold it and like clip it so it stays open to the page that has all the different beats. Yeah. And I try to kind of hit them as I'm writing. Yeah. Yeah. And that helps me to kind add of structure. To know that those beats exist. Like I know that they exist. Structure exists and um about and where you should be hitting them. You want to fit into it, you know. Yeah. Kind of uh have an aim and I never know what my ending is going to be. I sometimes know what my midpoint's going to be. You can also try planning those things out a little bit. And then be okay if they change. Then, right. They probably will. Right. I would say when you revise, I like to map that out if you didn't do any of it beforehand as a pantser. But I would just know that you're going to do a little more revising. This yeah, might yes. be a situation where having an alpha reader would be helpful. Yeah. And I think as a pantser, you have to be careful not to revise, um, not to polish right away. Like yeah. you finish your book and you're done and you go back and you're ready to revise and you start like making your sentences all beautiful. Like don't like that's Because yeah, you're going to delete that chapter. Yeah. Cause so super pretty. structure first, like just, just like grit your teeth and deal with whatever wonky sentences you have. I, and I totally did this myself. Um, 
and be like, okay, I'm gonna deal with that later. I'm gonna make them beautiful later, but revise for structure, right? Cause you, yeah, cause you don't wanna like polish up a whole chapter that you're gonna delete later. That's good advice, revise for structure first. All right, let's see what else we have. Okay, Deanna asks, for those of you who write in the morning before work or waking children, what is your routine? How ready for the day do you get before writing? How much time are you able to actually be productive with writing? I know we talked a little bit about this, but to specifically answer your questions, I definitely like have my desk set up the night before. Like I have everything how I want it to write. And I set my coffee machine up so that all I have to do is push a button or I can turn the timer on. I try to get everything ready. So I kind of roll out of bed and get in there and start writing. Um, but I, I wake up and get dressed and take a shower and put on your makeup and like be ready to start the day. I put pants on. That's about all I do. (laughs) And they're pajama pants. Like if you had to go to work after you started writing, then I would totally prep all that stuff the night before I would make my lunch. I would have everything set out, but that's also the type of person I am. Yeah. Um, I would probably write and then get dressed, and then get dressed, but just have everything totally ready. Yeah. I think that's what I would do. Um, so I just get my daughter up at, at six 45 in the morning. Well, she's, she's awake. It's not hard. <laughs> um, I'm very productive, but for me, I found that initially I was only giving, sorry, giving myself one hour in the morning. And I found that I was not productive with one hour because I it wasn't enough time. I spent the whole time like watching the clock. So now I get up earlier and I do two hours and yes, it's painful. And yes, I go to bed early, but I feel like I can truly like get into the groove of writing with that much time. Yeah. That's a great answer. I don't have an answer for that because I'm all over the place because I have teenagers and yeah, I know a long time ago, uh, your work schedule. So in college, I did some writing before I'd go to work and I worked pretty early. And I think I got everything pretty ready. I say what, you know, what works for you? It makes you feel less stressed about it and feel that you can actually settle into your writing instead of being worried about all the things you have to do to get out the door. Those are all of our questions, but we would love it if you sent us more. You can um, either respond to our calls for questions on Twitter, or you are welcome to DM us. I am at author Jess Payne. And I am at Seraphin 11 but I think also that's all we've got. Comments here on YouTube. Oh yeah, leave us comments on YouTube. We like comments and it, I, I think it's good for our channel too. And please subscribe if you haven't already. But I think that's all we have for today. Sarah, anything else? All right, come visit us on hashtag Moms Writers Club. Yeah. Every other Wednesday we have chats and, and um, it's a really lovely group. And we'll see yeah. you next time. Bye.